Hello and welcome back to the Agassi Nozinga show with me, your host, Agassi Nozinga. And this is episode number 477. That's 477 of the Agassi Nozinga show. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. If you're watching this via YouTube, you shall see my head is probably drenched in sweat. My armpits are on the way to dripping and I'm feeling quite sticky. But here we are. Here we are. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Of course, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe. And of course, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcasting apps, a five star review and a share will help to get the show a long, long way. If you could do that, spare a couple of minutes. It won't take long. Do a little of a clippy clap, clack, the click, clickety clack, share, like, all that good stuff. That'd be much appreciated. And of course, support for your patron is welcome to at patreon.com for Agostino. You can find the details and the link in the show description for a little as one dollar equivalent of one pound per week. You get access to my entire library of bonus content, which I upload specifically for Patreon, only for my patron audience. So make sure you jump on there at patreon.com for Agostino. I've just loaded a new episode of the, bo- oh, like a bonus episode basically last week. And I do that every week. So make sure you jump on that the next episode will be out this saturday so get involved don't delay get on it today bumba um 477 in it right we're just steaming through steaming through as fast as we can i'm actually steaming at the moment but trying to get as you know trying to get to 500 as soon as possible which is a mad run up in it considering i only started this in what 2015 is it 2015 i started this i think it's 2015 when did i start this actual thing I don't actually remember the date. When did I start? Was it 2015? I always look at my archive. I actually need to make a separate site so I can get everything hosted in one place. At the moment, it's just my Libsyn account. That's still, I've got all the details on it. But I started, according to Libsyn, in 2015, yeah. So to get already to 500 by the time we end this year, in only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, is pretty decent. Do you know what I mean? That means I'm properly tearing through all episodes so very very good to see is that eight or seven one two three four five six seven seven years sorry not eight um i'm tearing through this as much as i can uploading as many episodes as i can in a week i'm trying to do three sometimes four or five as many as possible why not you know i kind of adhere to the gucci main way of thinking about content i think in an interview once someone was sort of like asking him in a roundabout way why he doesn't do more quality control on his music. I think this was when at his peak, when he was dropping at least like, you know, 10 projects per year. And somebody basically asked him around about, well, hey, why don't you just like concentrate on making less um, mixtapes and maybe concentrate on maybe putting out fewer tapes, but with better quality um, in terms of selection of the songs and stuff. And he made a really good point. I think it might have been an interview with Charlemagne, actually. One of the interviews he did like post his little dust up with Angela Yee, where he basically exposed her for being these dms or whatnot but i think he mentioned something i interviewed like oh my only my f- i only make music for my fans basically i don't make music for people that don't like me so my fans always want to hear what i have to say they always want to hear what i sound like they always want to hear what productions i'm on they want to hear me talk that rich floss talk whatever he does right um so he's always going to put out as much possible material to satisfy his fan base and they're generally never satisfied because he's kind of given them an expectancy of covering so much music that he puts out so that was a pretty good way to look at it right like I've, i'm only doing this for my fans my fans want to hear as much as possible from me and if anybody else gets bored so be it but i'm only catering to my fans so with this show this is what i'm particularly doing you know if you if you enjoy listening to my ramblings anyway um i don't think a concentrated two episodes per week would really make much difference if i did three to five you know what i mean i think it's the same in my opinion maybe it'll be different if i maybe produce stuff a little bit better but the whole kind of um appeal i think of these sort of solo podcasts is the fact that you can listen to somebody rant and rave about things that you may not be interested in or topics that you might have seen across your own news feed and you're basically listening in to hear the person's point of view on something that you have read yourself right because usually we have maybe some differing um interpretations on the news and developments in culture and whatnot so i think i probably do a good job of doing that so far and i can only do a good job of doing me that's what i can do so again thanks again for everybody that's tuned in we're racing all the way to 500 i really appreciate the support as per now or from up until this point you know if you if you're enjoying the ride tell a friend to tell a friend in it tell a friend to tell a friend so um what was it happened so the other day monday um freedom day was announced well freedom day went down on monday actually wasn't really announced because i think they sort of took back the old phraseology of freedom day because in in fact you know as i'll talk about later 
there was a big revelation that kind of happened earlier on today that was basically the reason I think behind the sort of stepping away from the Freedom Day and more so a more of a cautious kind of approach to how things are going to reopen. But that aside, loads of ravers and clubbers all around the country in England were an eagerly anticipating at the stroke of midnight on a Sunday heading into a Monday on the 19th of July where they're going to be able to go and dance again in nightclubs and all over the UK places basically decided to either close just before 12 or stay open all the way up until the morning um to allow people to have basically their first dance opportunity to get get back on a dance floor go a bit crazy hug some friends kiss some strangers and all that good stuff and from the various clips i've seen so far it looked pretty decent there's clips of people going crazy at heaven which is a very popular lgbtq plus venue here in london in central london that looked really good there was a couple of nights happening in egg that obviously i mentioned i was going to go to but i didn't end up going because i'm you know i've been training a lot and i just want to leave all that stuff for the weekend plus i'm playing on the weekend so it makes a little bit more sense to kind of leave all the fun and the frolics for the weekend activities there was a couple of stuff happening at fabric that was pretty insane some stuff happening orange dude orange soho it's a new club that opened up um that i am fairly sure is pretty much tech house centric but a good sort of interpretation of what effectively happened was um, from the profile of Patrick Topin, who's a fairly prominent um, UK DJ, mostly, you know, for the tech house he kind of seen. And he played his first gig at this place in Newcastle. I don't know what the, the name of it is called, but it looks pretty good. So I'm going to pretty play much. I'm going to play a clip here from his Instagram stories um, of him basically at the venue with the queue outside and stuff and how insane it looked. But let's, uh, let's get this up here. Is it playing? Yeah, there you go. Let's pause it for a minute. But that's basically the queue outside. <laughs> it's called Digital in Newcastle. Mad queue. This tune Inside. Come on! Come on, last These guys didn't waste any time going behind the, the booth DJ booth today, right? The old um, quintessential VIP spot in all club arenas, isn't it? Being right behind the DJs, right? They didn't waste any time with that. Come on, play. Are you going to play? Look at all those joyous faces, eh? Where were they all? To, and again, you have to imagine a lot of these. I'd imagine in places like Newcastle, they're probably like what, what you would describe as being university towns, maybe, right? Um, a large portion of the kids there, or um, I, I guess a large portion of the foot traffic in these kind of places is probably dominated a lot by the local colleges and universities and whatnot. And there might be a high population of young kids in those cities anyway, in general. So just imagine or think to yourself, like, what were these kids doing prior? For these past 16 months or so right they were having to you know make do with parks that aren't necessarily that well looked after there's not really an abundance of like football cages to keep yourself preoccupied with community centers don't really exist in the way that they did when i was growing up so there's no real way to go and kind of wallow away the time and kind of get out of your house that way it's just bullshit in it so for them for, for the clubs to be finally opened it feels like more so just a spot to go and waste some time in the evening with your friends as opposed to people being obsessed or you know inspired or kind of drawn to being back in the clubs that's what it feels like sort of thing and that's good itself isn't it that's obviously good in itself but it's just it's great to see but it's also kind of disappointing to know that all these people will hold up in their rooms waiting for the day that they're going to be allowed back outdoors again and now especially with the development that happened earlier on today there's no guarantee that they're going to see this place again you know after september after october it's just a really really shocking state of affairs but let's continue <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Going crazy. Look at that. That looks like a vibe, isn't it? And, and 
that's something again we've all kind of missed out on right the end um scenery right at the, big, at the end of the club night when there's loads of clubs all over the place you know um eager cleaners trying to get everything nice and tidy so they can go back home they have no interest in you know chatting with you but you're there kind of chewing their ear off people in the dj booth trying to wall away the time and you know make use of whatever um extra thing or afters they got going on so yeah use yeah, my look at that yeah. cue mama mia That's insane, isn't it? He's actually, that's something you you forget as well about. There's some people have a lot of bad things to say about the tech housey business, business and techno people, right? But they're very rare in the fact that they actually have fans, isn't it? That's really interesting. Like there's, obviously there's people that outside of that scene that have a fan base, but in terms of like following them around and buying tickets to events and wanting to buy their merch and all this sort of stuff and supporting every single release they play and rinsing the fuck out of their playlist and stuff. This is a whole nother level of fan base. But anyway, regardless. So that was all well and good. Great to see everybody out again, having a great time. And again, that's probably more indicative of the overall club scene, I think, in the UK by and large, outside of all the little underground places. I think those kind of places are really part of the, I would say, the bedrock of that local community over there. It allows people to kind of dream, of course, if you want to be behind the decks yourself or get involved in hosting events, you go to a play a pilot like that and you, you know, you get inspired, you realize stuff that you want to do better or stuff that you can improve on or things that you wouldn't want to copy and bloody blah, 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 blah. Or even if you think it's lame, it gives you something to sort of like rebel and push against, isn't it? So those places are crucial in that respect. But they're also, again, just a, a place for young kids to just go and just wallow away some time in it and just kind of connect on the dance floor in a sort of carefree sort of environment is definitely awesome to see so definitely pick up everybody involved there with getting that started and like i said um for the most part most of the events look like they went out with went off without a hitch no real issues in that regard um but then another thing happened again today which is sort of thrown a real complete spanner in the works but in if i'm completely honest i'm not really that surprised and something that i've kind of quietly been talking to myself about and i kind of came to the realization a while ago i think maybe at the beginning of the year that more than likely whenever the clubs do reopen because it did feel like the tory government that we have here in the uk kind of went out of their way to basically be as um, vague as possible and um uncommunicative uncommunic uncommunicative whatever that word is with the nighttime industry in general they sort of treated nightlife as a bit of an afterthought even though it contributes a hell of a lot of money to the overall gdp of this country let alone the city as, itself but it did feel as if like they didn't really care about this you know the long-term future of most of these venues of people's jobs or people's ability to make an income it just seemed like a bit of an afterthought and i did think at the beginning of the year whenever the clubs do reopen we just need to enjoy them for whenever they are open for whatever time period that they exist for and i did think to myself you know what i wouldn't be surprised if somehow it turns out that we are able to travel to other countries in europe to go and party before we're actually able to party within our own shores and then you know the first delay of the june 22nd date or whenever it was that first freedom date that came and went because you know the numbers spiked up and allegedly we needed more time to get them under control and now the numbers are you know fairly up as well and they haven't gone down a considerable amount and now we've kind of been allowed to basically go back outdoors and resume clubbing and all that good stuff but then today when it was meant to be announced there's a weird twist of fate just before it was meant to be announced um Boris Johnson and Savage Javid the guy that took over from what's his face um were did come in contact with some Somebody that tested positive with COVID, so both had to isolate. So Boris had this big celebration he was meant to do in terms of announcing the Freedom Day. That kind of got scuppered. So he had to do it. He had to kind of do the whole press conference today in via Zoom, announcing the kind of you know um, lifting of all restrictions in the UK when it comes to COVID. And then in a weird, mad surprise that no one saw coming, right? Because usually whenever it's come to um, you know uh, outlining policy changes in terms of our approach with COVID, most of the time, for the most part, especially if it's been something contentious the information has been leaked to the press ahead of time to kind of gauge the public sentiment and then across you know over the over the next couple of days or whatnot then they kind of rejig it and then present it to the public but this is one of the first bits of information relating to covid response that has become completely out of the blue no one had any inkling of it whatsoever so this goes to show that they do purposely link that's this is confirmation if we needed it 
that the government does purposely leak stuff and if they want to keep secrets they can pretty easily because I, no one had any inkling of this anyone I follow on social who's really you know in tune with what's going on with the nightlife scene and everything and governments and local governments or whatnot I didn't hear a peep about this from everybody so this is really a big shame in terms of things going forward but again not a surprise in my book but the headline series as follows two jabs needed to enter COVID um, sorry two jabs needed to enter nightclubs from September and of course they're talking about vaccine passports going forward right so the you, the vaccine passports that we were led to believe wouldn't be introduced as a way to gain entry um, in various in industries is now going to be introduced as a way to come somehow curb the numbers of COVID. It's just really, really disappointing. So this is the following. People attending nightclubs and other venues um, where large crowds gather in England will need to be fully vaccinated from the end of September, the government says. Latest figures show 35% of 18 to 30-year-olds have not had their first job, which is the main thing that they're sort of combating against. They're hoping if they basically make it mandatory for you to have a vaccine passport in order to enter it's going to basically force this group of people from 18 to 30 to get their first jab at least which i think in my opinion will end up backfiring but hey let's continue currently nightclubs and other crowded venues are only encouraged to ask clubbers to prove um to show proof of vaccination and negative test or immunity which again is up to their own discretion but boris johnson said that he was concerned by the continuing risk of transmission the announcement came on the day the nightclubs in england were allowed to reopen after 16 months of closure the prime minister told the press conference on monday i do not want to have to close nightclubs again as they have as they have elsewhere but it doesn't mean nightclubs need to do the social but it does mean nightclubs need to do the socially responsible thing as we said last week we do reserve the right to mandate certification at any point if it's necessary to reduce transmission even though they said quite clearly i think it was dominic michael gover one of them says we're not going to have vaccine passports they're unconstitutional they're discriminatory like now nah, it's just yeah whatever and as i should um serve notice now that the end of September, when all over 18s have had their chance to de double jabs, we're planning to make four vaccinations the condition of entry of nightclubs and other venues where large crowds gather. Mr. Johnson added that he wanted to be able to take back that he, he didn't, sorry, he, he added that he wanted to be able to take back their freedoms, but to do this, we must remain cautious. Um, nightclubs are reopening in North Ireland and Wales on Monday, but they are still closed in Scotland. The Welsh government has said that it would never mandate the use of vaccination passport, but that the businesses would be free to ask for them which is definitely the way you should probably go about things and for me the thing that kind of really sticks out with this is number one i'm not surprised if if they generally do think the numbers are way too high to basically um really let the kind of reins off and say hey back to normality fair enough but then it kind of throws into question everything that we're doing right now right like why would you lift the restrictions to allow people to go back to nightclubs in the first place if people need to use covid next covid vaccination passports in order to gain entry because a vaccination passport for me is more so an indication of the kind of fraught nature of cases and deaths or whatever it may be right it's a clear indication that there's an issue happening and we're trying our best to keep a lid on it cool that's the first thing then of course there's this weird thing that's going on too about how do you individually mandate each club to make sure they do it who at the venue is going to be enacting such a thing will venues have to hire additional people to make sure that they scan people's details accordingly um will it negatively affect businesses in terms of allowing them to make money especially during the time that they've been closed for the best part of 16 months they're just about to get their feet under the table and they only have what a month maybe two and a half months of actually being able to gain some money back at the bar and then at that point um a large majority of their um punters or customers who are anti-vax or don't want to um you know have to share their medical details are now going to be um dissuaded from going to the club which is going to lead a lot of places to maybe having to close like what an absolutely insane state of affairs to be in and again like i said like there was no consultation from what i've read so far with the nightlife industry or the nighttime um industry or association whatever they are i think it's ntia um they didn't really consult anybody there wasn't a heads up given they found Found out about this complete change that's going to happen in September on the day the clubs reopened the same time that we did. So no heads up, no announcement, no way to kind of get your affairs in order, nothing. Just, hey, this is going to change again in September. And it kind of makes you think too. Um, if they generally think that they can reopen now, because, you know, um, if not now, when, that sort of kind of line they've been using, why would they need to have vaccination passports in September if things are meant to be getting better later on? 
And why would you, again, like I said, I'm not really a fan of uh, mandatory um, vaccination passports in order to gain entry in any places. I'm not a fan of forcing people to get a passport to do anything in life in general. But you would you would have think the best way to kind of get people to be more compliant would have been to maybe lay this out as one of the consequences of people not getting the vaccinations to begin with at the start when you started rolling them out, right? Maybe kind of lay it down as a sort of uh, backhanded, you know, not so subtle threat like, hey, guys if you don't get vaccinated or tested regularly then this might lead to this and this happening as a scenario this was never a scenario that was ever going to be on the table and there's a weird thing going on now where so allegedly it's going, only going to apply to nightclubs not to pubs which is again really really baffling why do pubs somehow become exempt from having a vaccination parcel but clubs but clubs are if anything some could argue especially the night the pubs that i can basically frequent in the area that i live in in london most of these pubs are basically in buildings that are far older though, than any nightclub i've been to so ventilation systems are pretty much non-existent in a kind of way to combat covid for the most part maybe for the general health and safety but in terms of it being COVID compliant, they are nowhere near good enough. So to suggest that somehow pubs are far more safer than a nightclub is pretty much insane. Especially again, if you've been to a pub in London, you know that, you know, the carpet alone has probably got more stories in it than the ventilation system itself. So I feel um, somewhat, somewhat sorry again for people who are in the industry who operate in these places who kind of again for myself as being a sort of you know a dj that plays in regular bar in pub in local bars and pubs and somebody that kind of attends the odd rave here and there on the weekend i don't really have that much skin in the game i have some skin in the game but my kind of day-to-day -day life and my ability to make money and pay my rent isn't dictated by clubs but for the people that are i just feel really sorry because your kind of future again is kind of left up in limbo you don't really know where you stand you don't can't really make any long-term plans at all um you don't know if you're going to have a job again in september you don't know if you're going to have a job again in august you know what i mean you never know how quickly things can change and i think i think i might have pointed this out before on the show but this is why I've said from the very onset, whatever time we get given to go out and to enjoy ourselves, just enjoy, just basically enjoy yourself. Make the most of it because there's no guarantees that this is going to last any longer than the time that we have available now. The same goes for holidays. If you're thinking about going away somewhere, plan your trip and try and execute it as soon as you can. I'd say within the next two weeks, to two to four weeks maximum, don't plan anything months in advance because there really is no guarantee that those plans will come into action or come to fruition at the future date that you want to go to and i think we've all kind of suffered it's, you know covid has taken a mental toll on all of us and i think the least the last thing you should be doing to yourself is abusing yourself like you know um without yeah abusing yourself on purpose by kind of setting yourself these um lofty things that you want to do and then having to disappoint yourself by things changing in the government that you don't really have any control over so if you can book something within the next two or three weeks if you want to go away if you're going to go back on a dance floor just enjoy the moment that you have available you know hug some strangers kiss some strangers hook up with people dance do a cook do loads of drugs and toilets and stuff do as much as you can in the space the time that we have available because there is no guarantee honestly that things will get somewhat better or but yeah there's no guarantee things will get better but i am pretty certain they'll get worse in the future especially if they're already doing these really duplicitous um sort of underhand sneaky tactics now because like i mentioned before at the beginning of this segment this is the first time in the history of the covid19 response in the uk where a legislation or policy has come in that hasn't been leaked to the public it always gets leaked before and because they want to test the you know the public reception but i think because they knew how much people would push back on this and how irate it would make an entire industry of people that they actively ignored and sort of kind of scoffed at, at the beginning of lockdown they kind of did this in secret and now they've basically left everybody you know holding their pants up and it's really really shocking but again no real surprise really like i said in the beginning i always kind of had imagined there was going to come a scenario where vaccine passports were going to be a mandatory thing that you needed to either fly or to get entry in certain places and i'm not for forcing people to get vaccinations i'm not for all of that nonsense i think if you don't want to get it you don't have to if you know all the health risk involved and you make an informed decision not to get it fair enough um but I do think also you just have to accept the consequences that come with it. Unfortunately, the government have put us in a position or we've put them in a position where we basically allowed them this unrequisite, you know, this sort of unrequented levels of control that they're now kind of reluctant to let go of. You know, this sort of level of influence and power is somehow addictive.
dictin, right? In in the manner it kind of how you would be able to control and change legislations and the fact that you're you know in front of video cameras every single day and you're on the news, you're in front of papers. It's there's something it's quite addicting. I can definitely understand why these politicians don't wanna let us kind of go back to living our normal everyday lives because if we do, they sort of they sort of disappear into insignificance, right? So they kind of really holding on to power and influence for dear life right even though they know you know more people are getting a bit more um, uh, aware of the case of what the issues going on they're not really being kind of twanged by all the news and all that nonsense but i don't know man i don't know it's, it's a bit of a kick in the teeth but like i said just enjoy the time that you have available in the club for now and then just take the situation every day as it comes but yeah two jabs needed to go into clubs from september man who would have guessed it in it who would have guessed it and then to continue what else we have here let's move on we don't want to talk about that Oof, so bloody warm it's absolutely insane how warm it is and then to make matters worse houghton one of the best festivals here in the uk right one of the maybe premier ones a festival that i kind of regret not ever going to the first one i remember the first one in 2017 had maybe one of the best lineups i've ever seen you know, I had like Andrew Weverall, RIP, who I wanted to see play in the festival because um, I've seen him play, you know, a couple of times in pubs here and there and a couple of clubs, but never really a full set. And I was thinking, okay, let me go see him and his element, you know, eclectic element, eclectic crowd under a tent playing for six hours. It was been incredible. But again, I missed out on that opportunity. And then a couple of years later, he ends up passing away, like super gutted. So RIP is so under Andrew Weverall, the king. Um, I think Seth Troxler was playing. It was a weird mix. I Ricardo, Seth, like then loads of really, you know, good local heroes from like South London and whatever playing, Rywax family and people and stuff like that. Like really amazing lineup, right? It's always meant to be, it's always kind of curated um, really well and they really go out of their way to try and have a good mix of people. And from the pictures I've seen and stuff, it always kind of attracts a fairly... Um, a fairly uh, diverse crowd, right? That's one of the things that sort of maybe lets down some of the more stellar venues here in London when it comes to clubbing. Most of the people that attend are kind of really young, right? So if you're kind of over the age of 23, you sometimes end up feeling a little bit old on the dance floor because generally everybody's like really, 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 really young. But then sometimes you get events and festivals that really do cater to the wide spectrum of musical genres and artists that do exist here in the UK and kind of pull off is obviously getting some help from other people from abroad as well to kind of spice it up a little bit but in general it's definitely one of the kind of um i would say even though it didn't really have a long history in the scene it definitely was one of the standout um festivals and festival season in the uk well um give all that big build up to say it's been revealed here courtesy of ra that they had to postpone the 2021 event again obviously they postponed it last year due to you know you know what but now they've had to postpone this this event again um because i guess it just can't get things done in time in it again it's just like another kick in the teeth for these events that are usually you know small um family teams independently run um maybe a couple of loans here and there but you know not anything that's sponsored by major corporations like jaeger Mars and whatnot and they try and do the best that they can to do best to do right by the community and the scene and then they end up the ones paying the price the most right because all these other big ones they can kind of um they can kind of take the postponements and the cancellations and the changes in policy a lot more easier because of course they've got insurance off their back they've got big sponsors that can kind of you know cushion some of the financial blows but festivals like this really 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 are kind of left up to their own sort of devices in it they kind of let, let, left on their own basically to kind of figure it out and it's really really sad man but anyway this is news first year of ra it says how to festival not happen in 2021 for the third year in a row the team has been forced to postpone the following year this time citing as the main reason that the uk government's failure to support the festival and the surrounding ecosystems during the pandemic as i said as restrictions are lifted today we enter the unknown um okay let's actually actually read the actual statement it's here before i got it here on the on the old facebook it is with great sadness that we announced that the postponement of how to next year in 2022 it comes with a um it comes with a dark irony that we present the news on what is to be freedom day we have done everything humanly possible to make the party happen um but the odds as they currently stand are stacked against us 
we are utterly heartbroken that this journey has come to an end but in order to protect the future of the festival we have to no choice but to stop here four months now we have waited patiently for our clear horizon but the ever moving information has led to a uh, blurred way um uh, sorry has also a blurred way um forward rather da, 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 rather than a roadmap which could be trusted making it incredibly difficult to give progress of our industry and surround the ecosystem and overlooked subsequently brought to its knees the track and trace systems um, supposedly set up to protect us presents an extraordinary challenge to our workforce it has the ability to reduce or remove a substantial amount of workforce at any point in this with a simple ping oh yeah true it's a good point i didn't really think about that how that could negatively affect a festival in it having many having like half your workforce essentially being rendered um you know uh rendered basically at home because they've been they've come in contact or come across somebody that might have covid mamma mia it has the ability to render the, the this is set to finish on august 16th the day after the festival ends without the correct number of skilled humans it is simply impossible to deliver the show safely and in full flourish we would like to thank for you for your loyalty and support without this we would certainly not have had to the world to carry on thank you to everyone who kindly supported um uh, we out let me in all the items in the collection that have been lovely purchased will be on their way to you shortly the sentiment contained within the campaign portrays a sense of frustration felt within our community our message has remained inspired optimistic and straightforward our aim was to continue with passion and commitment but um, up to the point when we were forced to abandon hope that moment is now upon us as restrictions are lifted today we enter the unknown consequently with political and scientific and scientific uncertainty in this current iteration incarnation we risk losing everything we will proceed jesus man me reading out loud is so shocking and so another year passes and we must now direct our energies towards houghton 2022 uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't even know how they even end up. I don't know how they even end up surviving until the next year, man. Big up them. Um, obviously, an info for ticket holders. We hope that many of you would choose to roll over, and if you can roll over, help them out. And anyone who prefer a refund, blah, blah, blah. yeah. So if you can, of course, ro roll over because again, these guys are one of the good guys. They actually put on a good event. Um, everyone that I've heard has gone there, have had had amazing time. Which not the it can't be said for most events that they go to, but what a kind of bittersweet moment in it where anybody else is out celebrating and having a great time these guys were basically sweating their asses off hoping that they can come with a resolution that would allow them to put their event on and then they find out you know that the track and trace system that they need to basically have amended for them or they need to have a change in how it's basically rolled out is going to end the day after the actual festival day ends itself it's just a really bittersweet moment to take but um hoping obviously the only silver lining is that because they've been able to postpone it off their own backs there is a future there for them going forward it maybe isn't clear for most people to see now but for sure there definitely is a future um happening very very soon so hopefully they're able to survive until 2022 and we can go back and rave there once again like i said i, I really regret missing out on that first rave in 2020 or that first festival in 2017 with that amazing lineup that played there prior hopefully be able to go in 2022 let's move on whilst we have here i'm absolutely leaking like a sieve so in other news that would be interesting to you it looks like Kanye West is releasing an album um there's some details for a listening party that's happening a oops that's it listening party that's happening in atlanta somewhere i think um mercedes benz stadium in atlanta um this happening on the thursday july 22nd which is awesome i think i think i mentioned it to someone the other day i was like you know Kanye West does a lot of things you know that people might think is fairly questionable but there's one thing that he's definitely world class at it's definitely activations across everything he does from the fashion to the shoes to the music especially his activations are really second to none no one really goes to the levels or the extent that he goes to in terms of releasing music and the way he does maybe with the exception of tyler the creator maybe drake right in terms of really putting money and maybe obviously kendrick j cole does it but only those kind of top top level guys everyone else sort of seems to just do the regular radio interview role roll out with you know maybe teeth and stuff on instagram but in terms of turning it into an overall active experience is awesome and i love how they've kind of flipped the whole listening party listening event thing into a public event and because it was obviously one thing that was generally um sort of the 
the privilege of people who are kind of in the know, right? It was kind of like a heads or no thing. You go to like a hotel reception somewhere, a lounge, someone plugs in their phone into an ox, and then suddenly you're playing the you know new album in the foyer of flipping Ace Hotel or something, RIP Shoreditch, right? That's what usually that thing happened. But now, obviously, with everyone's attention dwindling and moving around from artist to artist, if you're somebody like a Kanye, you need to make a big splash when you're dropping a, an album, especially somebody like him who doesn't really do singles. You need to make a big splash and get people's attention again because they've generally kind of moved on from you or trying to you know they've gained other they've, they've kind of gone to other things or maybe they've kind of got dissuaded because of some of his political rantings whatnot and there's no better way of doing it than booking out an entire stadium right you i don't even know who, who backs all this stuff monetarily i'd imagine def jam probably cuts a check but they've decided to rent out the entire mercedes-benz stadium in atlanta for a listening event that's only going to be i guess limited to a small amount of people i guess you have to get details so i'm not really sure how it goes along but there's the flyer itself allegedly designed by northwest but now i think it's been cleared up it's designed by a, a very famed acclaimed um female artist called i think louise bourgeois who passed away i think in 2011 or something so i don't know if this was a illustration that kanye bought and then used as a flyer for his album or something that was you know bought privately or something i'm not really too sure what's going on but that's the flyer itself going to release on july 22nd and then we've got info here courtesy of the jasmine brand they said they're hosting a opening party let's skip through it's a private event hosting on july 18 6 30 to 8 p.m um you've got obviously all the details there some of it um, blanked out for obvious reasons so only the ones that are in a note can go in the track list so far that's already confirmed because i think there's a video titled creator coming up next who's listening to it in the studio but you've got a sort of like is it 10 track one two three four five six seven eight nine ten yeah like a 10 track album as per usual he likes having 10 or 11 tracks i think that's his sort of like magic number in terms of having a cohesive project for number one track you got here donda remote daylight um i'm not sure what the other one is i think it's foundation or fountain or something we don't have the name for that one yet hurricane no child left behind and you again i know god breathed this breathed on this 24 you're going to be okay and come to life and then the next screen we've got a video here of tyler and kanye in the studio it looks like no sound or anything but supposedly um this is meant to be the album that he's playing for tyler that's meant to be insane so it's going to be a pretty um decent event to basically hear what that has to what he kind of has to bring musically and then you've got this absolute dullard in terms of justin leboy basically um giving more details behind the scenes as to what the album sounds like i don't really read too much into industry scoops in terms of what an album sounds like because for the most part they're all sucking each other's dicks because they want to be on the gifting list or whatnot going forward so he's not going to come out and basically say the album's a bit mid and in general this guy's a bit of a scrub anyway so you know i don't really take what he has to say in any opinion seriously but just to read out the tweets itself it says um kanye played his new album for me and kd last night in vegas man listen the production is light years ahead of its time and the bars sound like he's broken hungry trying to get signed again any artists who, who plan on dropping soon should just push it back hashtag respectively which is really cringe to say he's kind of basically um just kind of uh, playing to the crowd because a lot of people like myself basically said you know Kanye obviously it doesn't sound hungry because he's a basically a multi-billionaire he makes you know exceedingly uh, more money doing fashion and designing shoes than he does making music and of course he's got the um, creative and artistic freedom to do whatever the fuck he wants when it comes to fashion more so than he's got to do with music and in general he's maybe just lost his ability to maybe synthesize the moment as other people have because he's not really tapped into where he maybe was before it happens to the best of us but for the most part musically his output has been a bit shit um, apart from the project he did with Kid Cudi everything else has been a bit lame something I'm not really listening to too tough I think the best stuff has been obviously the Sunday service albums and um, they've been pretty awesome to listen to in terms of just like music um, that you can put on in the background but in terms of a Kanye West project I haven't really liked most of the stuff that he's done you know post uh trump support um again not the trump thing i don't really give a shit about that game i'm not american i don't really care what his political leanings are and as somebody like myself who's been a fan of the smiths and morrissey i've long kind of moved away from the idea of not being able to separate art and artist and i'm okay with him being a little bit of a um what do you call it 
a little bit of a contrarian in that respect and just being a bit of a troll and poking at people especially the black community in the usa and kind of calling out their hypocrisy or whatnot or just being a little bit of a coon that some people describe him to be i don't really care about all that stuff but i just think musically in general i think it's clear to see that creatively he's he's sort of like energies and his talents have basically been put towards the clothing because there's no way you can say any of his clothing bits have missed everything has kind of been you know 100 and people are basically eagerly anticipating the release of the gap stuff but then when it comes to the music it just hasn't got the same sparkle so you know whatever it may be um the next week says here Kanye West album is really done when it drops this week we probably were not going to listen to anything else for a while let me go and enjoy all the current artists I'm listening to you until then god bless Ken and the last tweet said Kanye had Kevin Durant a seven feet tall dancing um the album was playing shit was crazy okay I'm really out this time yeah being a lame in it there's something about a man that begs this way right that sucks up to somebody that way that is always going to rub me up the wrong way i don't know if it's just like unnecessary cuck energy or the opposite of being an alpha it's not even an alpha thing it's just more so just being a lame and corny right men shouldn't do this sort of thing men shouldn't be sucking up to another man like this in public it just seems a bit gross don't get me wrong if you had kanye in person and he's kind of saying he's a fan of your work and he's you know he's saying things to you that you would never imagine something that kanye say to you in real life fair enough fan out have a little faint cry to yourself but going on social media and writing these weird soliloquies which are essentially sucking him off it just comes across gross and then if the album doesn't end up sounding like um my beautiful dark twisted fantasy part two everyone's going to be ripping him to pieces anyway so but again he'll probably love this because it's all engagement in it so whatever fuck that guy and yeah, move on here um dropping soon more details again the same thing as before and then what's this it's the last one information based upon the album is that the same thing oh same thing yeah same thing but yeah i'm dropping hopefully on friday it says supposedly that's when it's going to drop when albums usually come out so um it should be interesting to see um what the reception is like again i'm more into this for the music i want kanye to just be able to produce all i want from the guy is just him to drop one more good album i'm not really for this idea that you know i don't really hold artists to their sounds i don't demand things of people i just want them to make good music i don't care about what it sounds like if it's deviated from their first album drop i don't really care it's like dj rascal when he dropped boy in the corner and his subsequent albums were terrible it was less about them not sounding like boy in the corner and more so about them musically just not being good um and obviously now in recent years he's kind of been able to turn in pretty decent albums but now everyone sort of moved on but still if i can get selfishly if i can get one more good album out of kanye i'll be done i'm, I'm perfectly fine with that i don't need anything more from it because again like i said i'm pretty sure it's hard to find inspiration um for so many projects at the same time especially at the level that he's kind of performing at you know when it comes to fashion to footwear um and then doing obviously he's doing building homes and shit and then to do music it just he's spreading himself too thin so it's pretty much diff impossible to do and the evidence is there ever since the easy has gone completely you know pop and this you know taking over things it's no coincidence that his music has kind of suffered and then the moment he linked up with somebody and was able to kind of bounce off of them you look at the Pusha T album you look at the collaborative album with David Cuddy Cuddy that bring guy the best in him when he's kind of left his own devices to his own and then he's got spread between different projects in the studio in terms of easy stuff the music quality tends to always dip a bit so let's see man hopefully it's good hopefully it's not hopefully it's good hopefully it's great good is not good enough for Kanye he needs to have a great album hopefully it's a great album more likely than not there'll be some subs for Drake more likely than not he'll probably throw his um baby mother Khan Kim Kardashian imagine referring to Kim Kardashian as a baby mother but anyway most probably he'll throw her under the bus so for sure if you're in for the messy stuff you're definitely going to get a dose of that when that ends up dropping there's no denying of that one um what else do we have here let's move on Ba, 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 ba. you got this article courtesy of hypebeast featuring some woman called helen kirkham so it talks about deconstructing the mx90 and the reason why i clicked it because the mx90 is one of my top five trainers of all time so to see somebody deconstructing the greatest sneaker i think one of the greatest sneakers of all time um is pretty offensive to me especially when it looks completely terrible and i think just speaks to the overall need for us as a culture as a scene to stop with the deconstructing to stop tearing things apart and putting them back together in these really horrible um crass 
and downright disrespectful ways um, and just learn to maybe make our own things, right? Make new original things. This is just, I don't know, I'm kind of bored of this. There's a couple of people who do this really well and I think they should be left to do it on their own. There's that girl that remakes everything so makes them into bags and shorts and shit. She seems to be actually talented. I'm not sure who she is. I'm not sure her name. It might be the Architects brand ambassador girl or somebody else, I don't know, but there's another one too. And obviously Virgil does his way of doing it in the kind of commercial level. But I think everyone else should just leave it alone because that little picture here like look how terrible this looks like what is that like what are you doing you're, you're destroying a perfectly decent colorway of an mx90 and turning it into something horrendous and look at that those are that's proper crazy eyes isn't it that's the eyes of somebody that's going to take your mx90 and say babe trust me i'm going to make something really nice and then you turn around and it's this that you get presented for your birthday and you have to pretend like you like it <laughs> like honestly man it's shocking it's courtesy of hype he says in a world obsessed with keeping hype sneakers box fresh helen um kirkham disrupts are you of course disrupting you already know disrupts with her handmade one-off masterpiece Pieces. from her london studio kirkham takes some of the industry's most loved sneakers apart and upscales our wasteful habits into new pairs that subvert conventional trends subverting yeah that's definitely something in it i don't I, I don't know anyway for her sneakers are less about the name brands and cosigns and more so about personality that mean to you <laughs> mate i don't know man the, 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 the only personality this looks like is like somebody who's has a dog that don't keep on a leash that's what that looks like chewing up your shoes as you're sleeping um this is what makes her special at helen kirkham studio some of your favorite pairs including the off-white nike of course included it are turned into something completely new as a vessel for self-expression worn and loved by people who wear and love their sneakers it's not authentic experience that champions craftsmanship and celebrate individuality and puts the subject of of making back into a sneaker production i don't know maybe it's just me right but if i'm going to if i'm to, if i'm like handsy which this girl clearly is i don't really like the stuff that she's doing but let's just say she's a handsy crafty kind of person wouldn't you just want to test yourself by making your own thing from the ground up or maybe utilizing parts and bits and bobs from other shoes to basically make your perfect sneaker especially now with all these um you know um fugazi alibaba sort of workshops and factories that exist where you can basically get a shoe made for you with different designs on the side wouldn't that be a better use of your time and your skills and maybe a better opportunity to showcase your talents as opposed to destroying you know perfectly decent trainers made by the world's greatest designers in an effort to sort of what capitalize on this upscaling um what was it what they call it this thing this stupid thing they keep saying it's that sustainability in the sneaker scene what is it called again it's a word they, they use here upcycle yeah upcycling stuff it's like what it's a if anything this just creates more trash because this is definitely more of a in the moment trend thing that more than likely in a couple of months will just be relegated to a vintage shop somewhere no one's going to buy it because it looks terrible and you don't know how to lace it up properly and it'll end up in a scrap heap somewhere or end up up some turtle's nose do you know what i mean like it's just not worth the time it's just what is this like nonsense um let's continue aside from personality and storytelling there's the okay um everything kirkham touches has a signature look and feel and in many ways her approach can be likened to the cult impact of the mx90 get out of here fuck off no way it can be really that what okay like what what is that like she turned it into like one of, what was that nike vapor boot that had a swoosh to the front it honestly looks terrible the panels don't look great the stitching is awful obviously because the shoe's been recycled the riff, like this is like a terrible um sort of copy and re and re reinterpretation of what virgil's doing basically it's like a bad version of it i don't like it it's like a it's like a it's like a it's like some tiktok kid decided to start doing sneaker customization you know what right I, i'd much again i'd much prefer to i don't i'd take a john geiger um you know snake skin covered jordan one again on air force one over these stuff on the over this i honestly would i've had enough of this upscaling anyway it's going to, what's your saying interview what got you into sneakers it's quite an interesting story because i was into traditional footwear to start with i started in the hands of it exactly and you see whenever someone says something like this it's quite an interesting story it, you know they're going to start waffling there's not definitely not a sneaker it definitely weren't really about the shoes life but then you know you end up taking a course in uni you end up stumbling into this because it's easy money and when you're a girl you know you capitalize on it because there's not many girls around so could it turn up for being involved but 
yeah, yeah. Anyway, starting off Hampton, I did Brogue dress shoes, and I think it was my personal style that got me to sneakers. I went to discover how they were made because I didn't know because I'd always done traditional shoes. So she can make brogues and dress shoes. Why doesn't she just make her own trainers? Honestly, she's clearly got talent to make stuff and put stuff together because it's not easy to tear, even though it looks ugly to tear something apart and put it together and make it look somewhat wearable isn't easy to do so she's definitely got a skill and a good hand for it why don't you just make your own shoe from the ground up my girl anyway um that's why a lot of my work has a tactile and handmade feel because i come from a place that kind of traditional footwear so by cutting and sneakers up and rebuilding them that's how you start to understand how they're made yawn 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 i went to get sneakers to cut up because um, i knew the pattern was different i remember the technician of mine when i told him i wanted to do sneakers he said you don't want to do sneakers because they're not a real shoe <laughs> i've always been interested in shoe concepts that constitutes uh, she probably should have listened to him you know when i started um, picking them and playing with the proportions and constructions i learned so many interesting things about the shoes themselves and that was really and that was it really what's difference did you notice traditional shoes the concept of repair and mending is really grounded you'd always get your shoes resold but in the sneaker industry that didn't really exist when i started to process i was interested in it if i'd create a sneaker that was so visibly tactile and handmade that you had no choice but to be confronted with the idea that it was made by a person because sometimes sneakers appear to be shelves bright and shiny and they devoid of the making so i really wanted it to bring an element of sneaker culture mate you know what right we actually like bright and shiny shoes there is a real big pushback against this whole like dis you know uh artificially distressed trainers where they kind of you know purposely make the sole yellow and maybe add some weird crumbling effects like the new jordan 2s that virgil has coming out no one really wants that you want your shoe to just look of good quality right you'd much rather want a jordan one that's actually made with some good levers um some high quality levers sorry was actually made with a good mold um a mold maybe similar to some of the jordans that came out in the 80s not much to ask but hey if you're paying upwards of 120 pound per pair you'd want them to be the shape that you kind of remember them being on the various scans that you stumbled across on sneaker forums and whatnot and you want to basically have a chance to wear that shoe again in, in nowadays but what you don't want is a shoe that's been purposely made to look like it's old or a shoe that's been taken apart and made to look like somebody made it by hand like who wants that if you want a handmade shoe just buy a handmade shoe don't buy handmade trainers like i don't know man I wanted to propose an idea of something worn, something secondhand, as a something new and beautiful and challenge the idea of newness and always wanting the next thing that's quite apparent in sneaker culture. Yeah, this definitely challenging, is it, mate? This is more than challenging. This is essentially, I don't know, man. This is just a waste of time. Have you ever wanted to product, um, have you ever wanted to put your product agility into a bigger scale production? Yeah, this is a good question. When I started, I was adamant that the sneakers had to be produced in this way. The concept of something being made to order makes it exclusive and really personal. And I actually offer a service where people can send old sneakers and I'll make them a new shoe out of their old sneakers so that they can have stories embedded into the material. That element is so personal that it has to be a one on one. <laughs> Mate, who's sending this girl her old, the old sneakers so she can turn them into flipping, you know, stuff that came out of, I don't know, a flipping Nutribullet or something like god damn it however collaborating with brands is another way that i can make my work more accessible which is good i just don't understand why these people don't just go and make their own shoe i don't really know I, the sneaker customizers are just one of the most bizarre bunch of people i've ever seen they waste so much time cutting up and putting together these nike shoes in an effort to get the attention of brands who are you know over over um, over subscribe to people that want a job there how many people are sending in cvs to work at nike and adidas and all these big companies right and, and the thing about these people too it's not as if they want to work in footwear because if you want to work in footwear in general you can probably go to like a lesser known brand like a mizuno like a diodora like an elisi and probably end up getting a pretty decent design job there but everybody wants to work for the same old you know big ticket brands you know the nikes the adidas and whatnot maybe the reeboks which are again over inundated with people applying there and they make these concoctions these frankenstein monsters of shoes in an effort to gain the attention of people who are generally either going to ignore you or just jack your idea and make it themselves and give you no credit that's essentially what's going to happen why don't just use your time and your resources and your obvious talent to make your own shoe from the ground up 
if you and if again and if you're good enough as a designer and people vibe with your stuff you'll probably still sell it anyway there's a real need there's a real kind of desire look at the amount of people on instagram remaking um their own version of flipping jordan ones that are making absolute killings off of them of course nike kind of scuppered that by filing that pattern and basically being on top of it but for the most part that shows that there's definitely a desire for people to have something a little bit different a little bit custom made a little bit um special bespoke tailored whatever it may be go out and make your own version of it what is this nonsense like no one wants to see this we've already got people doing it at the highest level like a virgil who's able to kind of do this way of kind of remixing reworking stuff and twisting it by three percent that design and methodology that he has but this is just awful i don't know i just think it doesn't work in this canvas as a designer what makes you grav gravitate towards the mx90 and my first experience ever night, I remember all the sister having a pair and they were white and she was getting beaten up and not white at all. I remember thinking that she was a pinnacle of this cool girl with these shoes without realizing it has always been in my life when I first started getting into sneakers because I've never a sneakerhead. <sighs> non sneakerheads designing sneakerhead shoes. And imagine a non sneakerhead trying to sell these shoes to a sneakerhead and not really understanding the culture but thinking you can educate them about sustainability and upscaling by first of all no no sneakerhead worth their salt is ever going to have a nike mx90 in this condition in the first place right right with the heel all fucked up like that no one it doesn't exist you're not going to have a shoe that's going to look that beat up and if it is that beat up you're just going to bury them wear them for football or use them as shoes that you do your kind of chores with around the house but you're not going to send them to a hipster designer to upscale them for you and charge you what 100 euros like 200 euros like if <laughs> What do you find when you cut them up? I love exposing the inside of the shoe. You can always show glue the foam. Oh, this, come on, man. Like, what is this, man? This is like, she's, she, she graduated from the Virgil School of, of Sneaker Design, isn't it? Clearly. Like, it's just a waste of everybody's materials and fabrics in general. I, I don't get it, man. I think everyone needs to stop with all this upscaling stuff. Just, again, take your talents and actually make your own shoes from the ground up. If people like them, they'll buy them. But allow destroying classic shoes, man. No one needs to see that. Um, let's move on. We've got here a story courtesy of Kid Cuddy criticizing his fans for criticizing his painted nails. Lols in it. You know, I love Kid Cudi, but he is a little bit sensitive, which makes sense because he does make great music. You can't be a great artist and not be a little bit sensitive. But he posted this picture of himself with a Mandalorian helmet, you know, with his two fingers up showing his immaculate, immaculate, immaculately painted and fingernails. And then he posted up there on his Twitter saying the following. Turn my comments off on Instagram, which you probably have to turn off again on, it, on Twitter too. For people, um, some people seem to really have a problem with me painting my nails. I got tired of the blocking so many accounts. I really need you to understand if you don't like me doing this or anything i do please don't buy my albums don't come to my shows fuck way off which is fair enough but it's just um maybe because again i've been on internet forums since i was flipping 15 and shit but i've never really understood this need to kind of police every platform that you're on on social media i understand it's your own private spot it's not really a private spot but it's your own little place that you can kind of curate in terms of the content you put on there but in terms of the reaction and how you interact with your fans you can't really it, it it seems counterintuitive to what makes in communicate what makes the internet great by having so many sort of like barriers and safeguards around how people can talk to you on certain platforms like removing the comments on a kid cuddy instagram page makes no sense because part of the reason why he's such a kind of cult icon to a small number of people is that kind of one-on-one -on -one connection he has with people right the ability to speak to people through his music you know going through some pretty dark times they're able to maybe write a response in the comments some people else might want to reply to it there's a kind of weird little community of course that exists around kid cuddy that will have not a bad words said about him in their kind of presence so obviously it's a small minority of people that have a problem with his fingernails because for the most part people are happy with Kid Cudi from the onset right from his unconventional lifestyle to the tattoos to the music he makes to how he approaches relationships to his battles with sobriety or whatever right mental health issues like everyone's they've been up they've been with him on the entire journey it, it doesn't really make any sense for an actual real kid cuddy fan to finally draw the line of painted fingernails especially nowadays where legitimately everybody in hip-hop or everybody in music for the most part who's sort of kind of creative and kind of consistent convinced considers a sort of avant-garde paints their nails it's kind of a, an accepted thing now no one really bats an eyelid at it no more so um it does seem a little bit ott it does seem like a little bit of an overreaction um he kind of probably just needs to kind of rein it in a little bit and understand that even though 
some people are coming out of the woodworks and criticizing him for his nails for the most part it's probably not the majority of his fan base i would imagine itself but that mandalorian helmet is flipping live but big up kid cuddy regardless isn't it big up kid cuddy regardless and then of course we've got this this is courtesy of hypebeast another look at the off-white and edge jordan one edge jordan two low sorry that's due to come out very very soon the color again is the white and red i've already talked about i think the black and navy color previously but again the point remains as i said previously if virgil is able to convince sneakerheads to queue up um to buy bots to you know f5 in all day on flipping certain websites and sell these bitches out if he somehow manages to convince him that a jordan 2 is on the next wave he deserves to be crowned the greatest sneaker designer of the mod of the 21st century or something i don't know he deserves some kind of reward like that he definitely has to do it he definitely has to be up there because that's one of the beauties of the nike 10 project that people don't really pay attention to was the fact that he was able to drop 10 sneakers all at once all with the similar sort of for the most part some of the similar sort of color base in terms of being mostly white on white and every single one of them sold out right they're all kind of go for at least double the value even the converses right some of them go for triple the actual retail value or the retail uh ticket price right so if he's able to somehow make people care about jordan 2s which for the most part are maybe the less coveted jordans um within like numbers one to ten if he's able to get people to care about this like he definitely deserves an award because i remember one of the what the most prominent version of this might have been the vashti jordan twos right she was i think she might be the first female to design uh, a jordan brand shoe or jordan retro and she got the jordan two which i thought was a bit of a piss take right she was at that time somebody very well um regarded in the scene and to go out and give her jordan two felt like a little bit of a kick in the teeth considering again um the amount of influence and kind of swag that she has in the scene and the affiliations that she's had and the time she's been in the industry you just feels as if like she decided that she deserved a better canvas and then of course as many years progressed someone like a lily may has ended up getting a jordan one that everybody was very fond of but in general jordan twos have never really got the biggest amount of love for the most part if you're a designer you know if, if you're a brand you want to obviously get the piece de resistance models so to give yourself a best possible chance of them being successful you go for the jordan one you go for the three you go for the four you go for the five you go for the six maybe the seven but you wouldn't go for a, a, a two a two is like going for an eight a two is like going for a nine or a ten do you know what i mean those are those are hard shoes to shift to like regular kind of you know um lifestyle shoe wearer guys you know what i mean like it's just difficult to shift those things i'm sure there's jordan groupies that love every single jordan brand that comes out right um for sure even the team jordan brand shoes which are pretty much the worst things that ever existed i think probably worse than the nike 6.0 stuff that used to come out back in the day but if if virgil's able to get people to care about the jordan too he deserves an award as maybe the greatest sneaker designer or collaborator of all time because these shoes are don't get me wrong the white pair they look fairly decent they look like a great kind of tennis shoe inspired thing the fact that he's kind of given this sort of like pre-age distressed effect on the midsole they would kind of look at to make him look like they're crumpling like the old school retros with the pu midsole when you don't wear them right when they've all been dried out and stuff that's a fairly good touch and you know um of course the discolorization on the midsole the levers look really good because for the most part when they do collaborations the levers are always a little bit subpar it looks like they kind of splashed out in that regard they've got this kind of snicky sprint pattern here on the back and really nice levers done here on the front and the laces and the twists and turns and bloody blah, blah 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 and the exposed bits of foam here on the on the on the top but it's still a jordan too you know what i mean again if he's making able to make people to care about these man he deserves an award so let's go continue on the pictures they look fairly decent again probably better than the black and navy colorway but not the best sneaker of it in the world are they not the best but hey congrats to him man he doesn't he just churns them out in it they give him they give him an idea and i wonder I, I'd, I'd imagine there's probably a big story tied to them in terms of activation i'm sure it's not just going to be a drop it's going to be other things tied in towards them but we've got no information on when they're going to drop oh yeah we do actually released on 23rd of september allegedly so far rumored release so um wait out for them when they do end up coming out wait out for them when they do end up coming out what else do we have here? Let's move on. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. I think that might be it. Yeah, that might be it. Let's leave it actually. Already an hour in already? We're an hour in and yeah. 
hour and two in. So for now, that's the Exit Zinger Show episode number. F- Sorry, that's the Exit Show episode number 477. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, please make sure you smash the like button, hit subscribe, and leave a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review. And of course, share the show with your family and friends. I'll be more than welcome. And of course, support via Patreon. So appreciate it too. You can find a link to my Patreon in my show description. You get access to all my bonus content on there. So go and subscribe for it. It's $1, one pound per month to get access to all the bonus episodes shows and again i'll see you guys again very soon take care be safe peace